It's Wednesday, December 22nd, and this is Open Mics with me, Dr. Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dahl Simons Family Studio. We are live here today after bringing you some Encore episodes. Because we want to bring you the latest on the impact of Omicron and Delta, we're not doing the repeat episode, we're doing the now episode. Mm. So today is mm -hmm. now. Thanks for joining us on Facebook and YouTube. As the number of Omicron and Delta cases continues to grow, these are the people who are helping you recover. Everyone from breathing experts to the doctors and to the nurses. And as the demand for services grow, so too does potential and real burnout. This morning, we will meet some of those hardworking frontline medical professionals who are here to help you. They need your help as well. So make sure to get your questions sent in to us on Facebook, YouTube, and the Medical News Network. You find the links right here on the screen. But first, Hawkeye, mm -hmm. or Dana Hawkins, Dr. Dana Hawkins, the Medical Director of Infection <laughs> Prevention and Control, Hawkeye. I'm here. The numbers have been rising. Mm. How are we today? Yeah, um, about where we were yesterday, which is unfortunate compared to where we were a few weeks ago. 64 active inf uh, infections. Uh, as compared to even like a, a few days ago, we were at uh, high 40s. So we've gone up considerably. Of those 64 active infections, 19 are in the ICU, 14 on the ventilator, and 19 in that recovery period for a total of 83. Of those 64 active infections, we have three that are fully vaccinated. So it's roughly about 5% 5 5 fully not vaccinated. Many. So that means 95% of the people here uh, were diagnosed with COVID-19 are unvaccinated. Again, a pandemic yep. of the unvaccinated, at least as far as hospitalization and death. Yes. Before we start our conversation, do we have any reporter questions today? I do have some that were sent Please. in. Good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good. Okay. So this is from Sheree over at Fox. With transmission rates and hospitalizations um, at the numbers they are, what are your recommendations for crowds? Does this vary depending on vaccination status, booster shots, age, overall health? Um, are the risks different with indoor versus outdoor events? So we'll start with that part of the question first. Yeah, Hawkeye, I, 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 I've been hoping somebody would ask this question. We'll get it right out of the way. Um, the rules of infection prevention yeah. control travel with you everywhere you go. Keep you safe up into this moment throughout the Christmas holidays and in the new year coming yeah. and going forward. The answer is what we've been saying all along. Yeah. If you're good, especially now with Omicron, let's be honest, Omicron is much more infectious. Maybe we can talk to answer this question appropriately. Yeah. Now that we think Omicron is either already the dominant strain or becoming the dominant strain, mm -hmm. let's show. We have a couple of slides about Omicron, guys. I wonder if we can show that. So, um, Hawk, you and I were talking just a little <laughs> bit ago. Mm -hmm. This is CDC modeling, kind of yeah. based on real world yeah. data. But what it demonstrates is the orange is the Delta variant. The purple is Omicron. Mm -hmm. As you look at it, you see a little, you know, Omicron came or maybe it's South Africa and Botswana, flights took it everywhere. Yeah. Then it got into Europe, then it got to the United States or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you see a little small percentage, but suddenly look at the big pop in it. And now mm -hmm. it's considered to be 73%, our model suggests 73% mm -hmm. of yeah. all viral, uh, all COVID-19 in the US right now is caused by the Omicron variant. Mm -hmm. And that differs regionally. So if we look at the next slide, what does that tell us? The purple again is the Delta variant. I'm sorry, it's the Omicron variant, and the orange is the Delta variant. You look at the Midwest, and now remember, this is of 1218. It is now four or five days old. Yep. And this virus, the Omicron variant, is supposed to double about every one and a half to two days. So if you look at that, back on the 18th, it's modeled that we here in the Midwest were around 37% Omicron. But now that it's five, four or five days old, Reliably, we're over 50% yeah. Omicron now, Hawkeye. So yeah. that's the dominant strain. Mm -hmm. We know it's much more infectious. We're not yeah. really sure about the severity yet. People want to believe that it's less severe, but we really don't know yet. We're going to talk a little bit about why that is and why mm -hmm. we don't know in just a moment. But at the end of the day, what we yeah. do know is that masks still works. The smaller number of people you have, the better. Outside is better than inside, and if you're mm -hmm. going to be inside around a lot of people, CDC recommends either A, you test, mm -hmm. B, everybody's fat, fully vaccinated and boosted, C, keep the number small, D, wear a mask. Hawk. Yeah, yeah, just a couple things. If we go back to that first graph with the bars, please, um, you know, what we were seeing in that is that the majority of those cases, uh, there you can see, you know, where all the orange is, 
those are the last few weeks, five, six weeks or more, we are still in that delta surge for hospitalizations. You know, the surge that we're seeing now in the hospital is not Omicron, it continues to be delta. Uh, now this is in conjunction with Omicron probably spreading more, just like you had talked yeah. about. You know, early data um, prior to Omicron, we knew there, there are some things that we know. If you are vaccinated and if you are boosted and if you're wearing a mask, you are gonna have a reduced risk of getting the infection. If that happens, you have a reduced risk of going to the hospital. If you do get the infection and you are vaccinated, and especially if you are boosted, you are going to have a reduced risk of uh, going to the hospital, having that severe disease. And we saw a lot of people, I saw a lot of people yesterday commenting on uh, KUSports.com about the um, the cancellation of the KU Colorado basketball game. And I think that was a very thoughtful decision. There were people who were still, you know, viewing this as an individual with this, this myopic view of these kids are going to be safe. They're okay. They're vaccinated. They're young. They're healthy. That's absolutely true. But what we saw, though, and my point is that Um, you can still spread this to other people. And there was a thoughtful decision knowing and understanding that everybody is going to be going home for Christmas, probably going to be seeing people of high risk uh, who are at high risk of hospitalization and severe disease. And that decision was made then to help uh, reduce the chance of illness in the short term. And that's the issue with this. You know, it is still very easily transmissible. If you are vaccinated, especially within the, those first three months uh, after the, the vaccine doses and after the booster, you probably have a reduced chance of transmitting it, but nothing is 100%. You can still transmit it to others. And so your actions do have consequences beyond yourself. And that's the issue with this because of what you were talking about, how transmissible it is. And we know that there are continue to be certain populations that are just high risk for severe disease and of course, going to the hospital and going to the ICU. So I think that is a large statement. We are dealing with the Omicron spread along with the conjunction, in conjunction with what we are seeing now in the hospital, which continues to be mostly Delta because those infections were occurring several weeks before this. Yeah, and I think that that's an important message. And, and here's what we know. We know how to bend the curve. What we don't wanna have is have Omicron bend us. It appears to be two to four times more spreadable, more contagious than is the Delta variant, was two to four more times more than the original strain. So what we have is a highly contagious variant that is coming through our population relatively rapidly. It's going to be by far the dominant strain, probably already is here in the United States and probably already is in the US, in our region. Um, and to your point, the case is being hospitalized because it takes, you know, seven to 10, 14 days before you, after you have the variant to become sick enough or either Delta or Omicron to become sick enough to be hospitalized. We don't know what the impact of Omicron is on hospitalization. Hawk, there's been some discussion Mm -hmm. about the South African data, which suggested that the numbers of people being ill were surged incredibly quickly. Hospitalizations went up, but it didn't go overwhelmingly because they, the likelihood of being hospitalized was 25% less with Omicron than Delta. Now, that's the number. They, I went back through the data yesterday. It was 25% less. So let's just say it right out loud. It doesn't mean it's 75 or 100% less. It's only 25% less. And if you get a lot of people spreading Omicron, the likelihood of having a big surge in the hospitals mm-hmm. is really high, Hawkeye. Yeah, and that's why, you know, I'm hoping some of that with the South African data, it's because those people were previously infected, so maybe there is some amount of natural immunity, younger population. You know, we do have a lot of people who are thoughtful and conscious about doing things and and wanting, uh, conscientious, wanting to get vaccinated and who have been vaccinated. Hopefully that will help reduce their risk of going to the hospital. But to answer Sheree's question, you know, we know what protects you. We know the big picture issues. And it is understanding those situations that you're in. Number one, it's getting vaccinated. Number two, it's understanding the non-pharmaceutical interventions, using masks if you have concerns, not going into those indoor spaces, being outside if you can, distancing if you can. All of those things are layers to help provide more mitigation and reduction. And number one, you getting the disease and then, of course, you uh, suffering the ill effects from it. Yeah, I think that's right, and especially the impact on our elderly. So I think our message is still the same one that we've been giving all along this pandemic. You got to establish what your risk factors are. You got to establish how much risk you're willing to take on and how much risk you're willing to give to the others you care about and love and the people you're around. 
And then from there, you can kind of decide, this is what I, how I want to act during the holidays. I'm with you. Canceling a basketball game on an indoor arena, watching the NHL, put a halt of stuff. I, I'm all about that right now. You can see what's happening to the Chiefs. And, you know, I bet that's Omicron spreading through the Chiefs too, right? Because it tends to make you have fewer symptoms. And if you're vaccinated, you may not even have symptoms. So you may you get a test and all of a sudden you've got the thing, but you, can't, you don't want to be giving it to everybody else. And so at the end of the day, um, what you need to do is you got to practice really good infection control. And the people who can bend the curve are not the people in this room, right? We're here to take care of you if you get bent by the curve. But you are the ones who can bend the curve. And the only way you can bend the curve is to follow the rules of infection prevention yeah. and control. It is not popular to wear a mask. Elected <laughs> officials don't want to put a mask mandate back into effect. But here's what's going to about to happen. If hospitals get overwhelmed and schools don't have teachers and large portions of kids are out, guess what? We're going to be back masking. We're going to be back having to try and do hybrid learning from home. We're going to be back not being able to sporting events. That's what we face if we're not willing to make the simple choice yeah. now, Hawkeye. It's about the simple choice. Yeah. And, and I think with those simple choices, Stephen, we've talked about this. It's not all or nothing. These things aren't isolated in a vacuum. You know, we agree with I don't think you have to do those shutdowns. We can keep businesses open, but at the same time, we can keep people healthy so that there are workforces. There are clients that come into those businesses doing those things. But it takes those individual efforts and the efforts of the community to do everything from a public health and a medical sense. And that is trying to implement those non-pharmaceutical interventions as much as possible. And it especially is getting vaccinated. Because if there's one thing we know, vaccines work. And what we have seen from early data with Omicron, vaccines still work. Vaccines still work and the booster is really important. Okay, Jess, let's see what other questions are out there. Yeah, I've got two more media questions. Uh, Nathan from 41 asking, and you may have touched on this a bit, but reports indicate the Omicron surge in South Africa has already peaked. Dr. Fauci said that this week he expects Omicron will soon peak here as well. Is that a good sign or a sign that Omicron has affected so many people so quickly? Yeah, I think it may be both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I think that what we're seeing is that Omicron, because it is so transmissible, jumps from one person to another really rapidly. We don't really know the story about reinfection with Omicron yet. Let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. What we know is that this is your initial infection, mm -hmm. so does it doesn't burn through the population and then cycle right back. We don't know the answer to that, right? We've got to figure that one out. And we won't know that one for probably another month or two. But I think it's so highly transmissible that that's right. It went into South Africa. It got through South Africa relatively rapidly. And then it, so it peaked, and now it's starting to fade a little bit. And their numbers are start, of new cases are starting to drop. The problem is what happens when things peak and what happens to our healthcare workers who are already burned out and tired? What happens to the businesses you rely on that you want to go down to the grocery store or you want to go out to dinner? What happens when a lot of people are sick with this? It's going to hurt, I think, Hawkeye. I think we're in for a little bit of a bumpy ride. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are so many caveats when you look at specific countries' populations compared to the United States. We've always said it is very difficult to compare the United States to other. Now, we can take issues of truth from the other countries' data and from their experience and apply that to us, but our populations are so different. We have different geographic regions. We have, obviously, we know that political beliefs that have come into this a lot. So we know that there are those things. Um, hopefully it is a combination of those. We, we have heard Dr. Fauci say maybe the peak will be, I think, what, mid-January or late January, mm -hmm. I thought he said. But during that time, uh, we will continue to see that the vast majority of people who are suffering those ill effects uh, or have a preponderance to suffer those ill effects continue to be those that are unvaccinated. And I think that continues to be the story as well. All right, Dr. Seitz, uh, one more question from the media. Uh, Carlos with KCUR is asking, um, I read reports where Omicron has been detected in wastewater. Can you offer any, um, any further information or data on Omicron in Missouri? Well, you know, we looked at that slide of the modeling from the CDC just a moment ago, if you can go back to that, guys. And what this does is it, it divides us up into different, not that one, the next, that's it, the one that looks like it's got clock faces all over it. It um, mm -hmm. uh, looks like time zones. But the reality is these are each different regions that Health and Human Services divides the United States up into. And you can see the region that Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa are there together. And you can kind of get a sense. As of 1218, the estimate of Omicron was 37% in our region. Now, the problem is it's also estimated that, that Omicron can double every one to three days. 
This is what I think kind of caught people a little bit off guard because we thought we were around, you know, a small 13% in the U.S. And suddenly it, the, the CDC is now estimating at 73%. So if it was 37% in the Midwest five days, four or five days ago, what is it today? The reality is it's probably, you know, a lot higher than that. I would guess that the majority of new cases of COVID-19 we're seeing right now are Omicron because that's how fast it overtook other areas of the country. So I think that's probably what we're seeing here. I would estimate that we're probably somewhere in that 60 to 80 percent. Omicron may even be higher than that. You know, it's listening. Uh, I was listening this morning talk uh, to This Week in Virology, mm-hmm. and they had one of their infectious disease experts on. And, you know, the, the podcast was done on the 18th, and he was, he was estimating that the U.S. is yeah. probably around 30%. Well, then you look at the modeling, and we had it all wrong, right? If this modeling is correct, we're 73% mm-hmm. on the 18th. Wow, this thing is really spreading fast. And I bet that's what the story is. Mm-hmm. So it has been in wastewater. The wastewater detecting, and, and, and this is an important lesson for us all. Across the world, we have been way behind the speed of Omicron. No one got how fast it was going to spread or that it was already in the U.S. long before we thought it was mm-hmm. and already beginning to spread. So I think it just is a, it's, it's, it's why we need the investment in our public health infrastructure mm-hmm. if we're really going to be able to detect early so we can take action to try and stem this tide. But um, we don't. We still haven't made that investment, and so we're always playing catch-up, Hawkeye. Yeah, and I, I would kind of encourage anybody, if you're out doing some shopping or out trying to get some exercise, you know, go to go to those podcasts. This week in virology, it was Paul Offit who was speaking, who was yes. one of the leaders in, in our, our vaccine um, and how we use them and, and with ASIP and all that. Nature Magazine uh, or the Science that Journal was a, they're, they're a great also that has, has, yeah, they had a really good has a good yesterday. podcast yep, as yep. well. Yep. And they have... Uh, good articles about Omicron as well that are very easy reading, uh, but the Nature Podcast or This Week in Virology, and I would say also a lot of this does have to deal with human behavior. We have seen people, just as you talked about, everybody does have cows now, COVID weariness syndrome. We don't want to be wearing masks, and you can see it. It's evident out there in the public. People are out gathering for pre-Christmas get-togethers with friends and, and other people, going on party buses, things of that nature. And so there's a lot of aspect of behavior to this as well. At the end of the day, Jess, the rules are still the same rules. They still apply in 2020 and 2022, and we are really tired of the rules. I get that we're really tired mm-hmm. of the world rules, but you know what I'm mm-hmm. even more tired of? And we're going to turn to our healthcare workers mm-hmm. in just a moment. Tired of yeah. watching people suffer and die from COVID-19. <laughs> Any other well, questions out there? No, but we're getting a bunch of community questions. Right. So I know let's that talk to our cover. Let's You're talk to our guys. That you're live today. So um, All right. get after it, and we'll get to let's some questions it. here in a bit. All right. A new study at Ohio State University has estimated 30 to 50 percent of healthcare workers suffered mm. or are mm. suffering burnout even before the pandemic. Those numbers are now 40 to 70 percent. Nursing burnout is particularly alarming, with many nurses retiring early and younger nurses leaving the profession. There are turnover rates between 30%, 60% in new graduates. I don't know how we would take care of patients without our nursing staff. Uh, I'll tell you what, they are ace. And uh, I can't imagine a world in which our nursing staff or our respiratory therapy staff is not there to help mm-hmm. us, especially when folks turn really ill. So what can we do to help as the Omicron variant spreads so quickly? Let's turn to our guest today. Joining us is Dr. Chris Brown, a hospitalist. He's been here in our program. Welcome back, sir. Yes, sir. Grant Ogden, a respiratory therapist here, and Unit 61, one of our ICU nurses, Caitlin Beatty. Good morning to you all. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Good morning. These are numbers. They're not anything we want to see. The winter's just getting started, and with the holidays, it's going to get a little worse now, I'm afraid, as we know that people are gathering indoors, et cetera. Dr. Brown, let's talk about the number of patients we're currently treating it's kind of grown up, grown up a lot from thanks, since Thanksgiving. It has, it has. Um, you know, when you think about, you know, mid-October before Thanksgiving, um, you know, those numbers were maybe I think in the 20s. And from what Dana just gave us, it's tripled almost. And um, I think right now on my service, it kind of echoes what you all have said. I think I have two patients that have received at least the first two vac- vaccines. Um, Moderna and Pfizer, but they did not get the uh, booster yet. And then the rest are all unvaccinated. Yeah, it's tough. Grant, let, let's talk a little bit about, um, in your area, respiratory therapy. Talk to us a little bit about how your team is doing, how the respiratory therapists are handling all this. I, got, I bet they're a little tired. 
They are a little tired. Um, our operational tempo has really increased a whole lot. Um, this is a time of year where you have a lot of uh, respiratory illnesses with RSV and everything. With the increase in COVID, it's just it's kind of wearing on us. So, um, you know, we're we're definitely uh, making it through, but it it is kind of heavy. It is, and we're down the number of respiratory therapists we should have, right? I mean, we're not staffed our full level or anywhere near it, I think. We are, yeah. Um, so we're – there's a lot of RT burnout as well, and with that comes uh, a lot of RTs leaving, leaving the hospital and uh, finding jobs elsewhere, not necessarily in healthcare, care, but um, in, in other – Another other areas all together, right? And and just to say, this is not a okay, you right. This is a national problem. Right. We're actually better off than most by far. But on the other hand, it's a concerning trend. And I, does, it, does it frustrate you when you're out in the public and you see people not wearing masks and all gathered together, and you're just like, oh my god, I'm going to have them as a patient. It is kind of frustrating, um, but what it comes down to is, you know, we we all make choices and. Sometimes your choice is going to lead you to the hospital, you know, and if uh, your personal choice is to not get vaccinated or uh, not wear a mask, um, you're not only putting yourself at risk, you're putting other people at risk, um, especially those who are elderly or those who... Uh, aren't able to get the vaccine. So, Kaylin Beatty, it's got to be especially hard up in the ICU. You're in the COVID ICU. Things are a little busy right now, again. Yeah, they are. And similar to what Grant was talking about, we've had a really high turnover rate. There's no amount of school or training that can really prepare you for um, walking on to a COVID ICU and seeing these patients who are the sickest patients that we've ever seen um, for the phone calls with their family, the daily, multiple times a day uh, phone calls telling them, you know, they're, they're not doing well, we're not sure um, what our outcome is going to be, and knowing that in, for the most part it is preventable at least getting as sick as they have, um, you know, seeing the guilt on families' faces from maybe they went out or they made choices and got their family members sick and seeing them um, come up to the unit when they're, it's time to say goodbye and seeing the pain in their eyes and just seeing how hard it is for them to go through. Um, it's hard for us. There's, there's nothing but support that we can give to them at that point, and it's difficult to watch them go through that. And that has got to be really, really difficult. And unfortunately, this is a, a hard time. What, what, how do you feel when you, you're out there and you watch everybody kind of gather together. I mean, I know we're, I'm tired of having to say it all the time. You know, it's exhausting. I told my family last night, man, I'm just, why I'm just tired, exhausted, yeah. tired. You've got to feel like that. I mean, you're right there in the trench. Yeah, it's, it's exhausting. I mean, before COVID, you could kind of leave work at work and now you go home and you log into social media. It's all over social media. Um, you log, you walk into a store and you know, you see these people who aren't taking the precautions, who are actively um, maybe putting false information out there or just not really listening to the research, to the data, to the experts about how real this is and what the impacts and the outcomes can be. And it's frustrating because people just don't listen to us anymore. Um, you know, at the start, people celebrated us. They listened to us. They took the precautions that they needed to. And now it's just a lot of frustration, a lot of um, people getting angry at us for just trying to keep them safe and trying to keep them healthy and at home with their families where they belong. Yeah, I uh, mean, I couldn't have said it better than that. So, Kevin, as you see what's happening in healthcare today, did you ever think it was going to look like this? Absolutely not. I don't think anybody in the world thought we would be at the point that we're at. I don't think that anybody in the healthcare world 
signed up for this. Um, and even, you know, I remember at the start of the pandemic, we were kind of in the same boat as everybody. We were like, oh, it'll just be a little bit and then we'll get back to our normal lives. And, you know, we also want to go out to restaurants and go see our friends and our families. And day in and day out, we're here taking care of these really sick patients. We worry about bringing it home to our families, to, um, you know, our Christmases, to our grandparents, our parents. Um, and yeah, it's it's hard to know that we're still in a very similar spot that we were almost two years ago. Um, and that, you know, there's not really a super, or a, an end in sight that we're seeing yet. Grant, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, yeah. So um, with, with burnout, like, I, I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more people leaving healthcare just because they are just burned out and um, unfortunately the rest of us are going to have to kind of pick up the slack in that in that respect so yeah and i would say you know the physicians get a lot of uh of air time and credit but if there is a if there are groups of people you do not want in getting burnt out who can't come to work because of that it is the nurses who are there minute by minute and it's the respiratory therapists who are delivering life-saving oxygen and breathing treatments and so i think that that needs to be continued to be reinfororced yeah i just say uh, i've worked uh, uh with joyce funk she's the nurse i've had the pleasure mm -hmm. and honor working with for 18 years i think she's the best nurse in the world and, and uh i know she's tired it, it, just in the outpatient side of having to deal with the same question same folks and then people just not wanting to get vaccinated and and pretending like it doesn't exist and it just it just you're just like shaking your head and dr brown on the inpatient side mm -hmm. How are our hospitalist teams doing? You guys are really taking care of so many of these COVID patients. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same thing that they've been saying. I mean, um, our uh, work model, work day per se, has definitely changed. I think um, when you think about the COVID patients, um, I think the big difference is, is that normally non-COVID patients, we can, you know, speak, communicate with the family. I think nurses in RT would agree with that, meaning that the family, the caregivers, the loved ones are present in the room is real-time interaction, is real-time discussion. But from the COVID perspective, it's isolation, it's closed units. And now we're having to have those same conversations with family members who are at home. And we're trying to explain and answer questions and build trust, et cetera. And I think another thing, at least from, from our standpoint, is that, you know, when we take care of, you know, heart disease or strokes, et cetera, you know, we explain those things to the family members. But now with COVID, I find myself now having to also somewhat take care of families over the phone because we have a COVID-19 patient, but a lot of times we have people in the home with COVID-19 as well. Yeah. And, you know, I find myself, I guess, maybe over the last couple of days, I think, I think at least two times I've had to kind of encourage family members to present to an, the local emergency department. You don't sound well. You start picking up on cues where yesterday they were able to complete, complete sentences, now they're not. And we are trying to entice them. So you find yourself managing the patient, you find yourself managing the families, and then you know too, um, you know, we can't take, we don't, you know, previously kind of like what she said, you know, we could leave work, we're done. Now we're having to communicate after hours, et cetera, because that's when families are able to meet and discuss hard decisions that relates to their, 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 their loved ones. So um, I think across the board, I mean, it's a, it's a little difficult right now. I think burnout is across the board. Um, and, you know, kind of what Dana said, I give kudos to the nurses in RT because, you know, they're first line. They are first um, line. You know, and so I will always continue to give kudos to them for that. Yeah, I think of all the areas of medicine, it's not the medical staff. It's really the nursing staff and our RT staff who are, and I, we should extend that to social work as well. Yeah. But the respiratory therapists and the nursing staff are really the folks who get hit the hardest uh, by this and uh, really have to shoulder not only the greatest burden, the emotional burden, but also the risk burden of being all right. Mm -hmm. So in, on, right around these procedures, the aerosolized procedures and being in these patients' rooms all the time. Caitlin, do people still act like there's the patients or the families? Are they still surprised that it's not a hoax? Um, we have had multiple family members who've called and said that they don't believe what we're doing is true, that we're, um, they believe that it is a hoax. And it's 
it is hard with the isolation. They, you know, um, as Dr. Brown was saying, you can have these patients who typically their family members are at their bed, their bedside, they're holding their hand, they're seeing all the minute by minute, hourly tasks, daily tasks that we do to these patients. And they don't see that now because it's all um, phone calls or FaceTimes or those kinds of things. So it's, it's hard for them to grasp, especially once you get to the ICU level, how sick these patients are, the ones on ventilators, the amount of care that um, goes into them, you know, it, it can be uncomfortable for them, um, for the family member and for the patient to see and to understand and to really grasp um, how sick these patients are and what, they're, what the patient is going through. Um, and it's hard for them to get it and it's hard for us to be able to explain it uh, to them. All right, Jess. What do you got? Okay. So, well, first I want to start with a comment from Marie, and she said, thank you so much for talking about and to our nurses and respiratory therapists. So our viewers um, are also acknowledging all of the hard work that, that you all do. So we appreciate you, and so do they. Um, I have a question from Terry and Meg have a similar question. Um, Dr. Seitz and Dr. Hawkinson have repeatedly, each and every day, stated that this pandemic is of the unvaccinated. So why is there not a movement within the medical community to adjust the criteria for monoclonal antibodies to include unvaccinated individuals of any age and with any health issues? Well, first of all, Hawkeye, we don't have enough monoclonal antibodies right now. But that was another discussion I was listening to on the way in on the radio. Who do you give it to? And some people are only giving it Mm -hmm. to unvaccinated and not to the vaccinated, which makes me feel a little funny, actually. But um, the... uh, uh, the reality is there's only one monoclonal antibody that we have currently that's going to work against Omicron. It's yeah. new, and it's in very yeah. short supply. Yeah, you know, I think that information, um, first of all, there are, there are EUA criteria. So based on how the medicine was authorized, we have to stick with those criteria. In addition, the monoclonal antibodies are for those at higher risk. So we certainly use age, other comorbidities vaccination status is not in our criteria at this point in time. So, um, you know, there are, there, it is a pretty broad criteria for being able to get monoclonal antibodies. Um, unfortunately, just as you said, number one, the supply, the infusion time, all of the systems that have to go into it. But also, like you said, uh, with Omicron right now, um, there is few options to use for that not as before um, with with Delta, as we saw. So I think what we're going to see is that we're going to be forced to narrow those criteria. I know some of the hospitals in New yep. York are narrowing their criteria to make it even more selective, so you really only give yep. it to the highest-risk individuals and not to mild or moderate-risk individuals. And the reason is there's simply not enough drug. Right. And and if you remember, the data showed that those at most high risk of hospitalization – is where you have the monoclonal antibodies helping the most. If you are otherwise healthy and 30 years old, you really don't need the monoclonal antibody. And we hear people say this all the time, this disease isn't bad. If you're young and you're healthy, you're gonna be fine. I mean, for the most part, yes. And if you're playing probabilities, yes. And so in those criteria, you are not severe, you are not at severe high risk of disease that then would enable or have you need to seek medical care. So we do need to save it uh, for those highest risks for going to the hospital, but we also have to use it within the restrictions of that emergency use authorization as well. And, and just to say, you, you can play the game and say, well, I am, I am I'm less likely yeah. to get really sick or die if I'm younger and healthier, and that's a true statement. It, you are less likely. Um, and it's also true that everybody thought the Arizona Cardinals were going to destroy the Detroit Lions last weekend, and that is not mm-hmm. what happened. So, you know, don't be on the wrong end of that bet. Jess. Good. There's your sports analogy of the day. Yeah. So Carl. I'm going to sing know, later. Go ahead. Oh, great. I will look forward I came to dress. That. You know, I came dressed for the occasion, right? Let's be honest. You, uh, I'm sporting a cool vest. I'm sporting a cool tie. I actually have them for my suit coat today. I actually have the little pocket thing, you know, 1999 off Amazon. It's pretty, it's, it's, it's the way to do it. Merry you do. Christmas. You look like you're going you look like you're going to Christmas homecoming. I love it. You look great. Yeah. Um, okay, but I'm so not Carl going out. Stay in my house. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I know that. Okay, so do T-cells protect against COVID? Mm-hmm. 
Well, T cells protect against lots of infections, mm -hmm. and yes, they protect against COVID. It's one of the more important forms of yeah. immunity. Remember, the vaccination gives you multiple lines of Im immunity, B cell, T cell, mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of subsets beyond that. Yeah. And I think um, it, it it's probably takes a master class, literally, to try and explain all about yeah. how the body handles infectious disease, Hawkeye. But yeah, T cells definitely protect. That's one of the things we really like are the memory yeah. T cells. We mm -hmm. know that even when your antibody levels decline, you can still get yeah. a lot of protection from vaccination because those memory T cells stick around. Mm -hmm. And when you get a boost, you're not only boosting your, your antibody levels, you're also giving a little boost out to those T cells to give them a, a gentle prod, a gentle reminder that they should keep Omicron or keep COVID in their memory. And so uh, yeah. T cells, definitely, they definitely help. Yeah, very simply put, we believe it's probably the T cells that play a more important role in protecting people against severe disease. We also believe it's probably those T cell areas on the spike and those epitopes is what they're called that remain unchanged or less changed than some of those other parts on the change spike, such as with Omicron. And so it is our ability for those T cells to continue to interact with those areas that, again, help us to uh, be pro more protected from severe disease, even though we are using vaccines that have the ancestral strain of spike in it. We've been able to give the vaccines, they've been able to uh, induce those B cells and T cells and then over time, especially when you are further out from that second dose, those T cell responses continue to mature and evolve. And we feel that is one of the main reasons why these vaccines still work. We have very good uh, T cell immunity to help us protect against severe disease. So, you know, the difference is what B cells do. B cells produce antibodies. Antibodies go up and they cover yeah. up different parts of the virus so it can't get into a cell. But what happens once it's in the cell causing disease? Well, then the cell sends out little red flags and says, hey, something's bug. I'm, I, this is not right, I'm, I, I'm in trouble. And the T cells come up and they zap that cell yeah. and then the cell dies and then the virus dies and can't replicate, can't yeah. replicate and dies. So there are two different things. B cells secrete antibodies that go cover up the parts of the virus that try to invade you, T cells, come and they try to kill the cells that are now infected mm -hmm. by the virus. And so they're both important. They're different layers of immunity. And that's why you really, you want, you know, in this case, uh, the more the merrier. Sometimes though, what happens is the body gets short circuited and it starts to cause lots of inflammation, not mm -hmm. just the T cells, but lots of other cells in there. And that short circuiting is what causes a lot of the lung disease and eventually the respiratory failure that, that mm -hmm. makes our RT folks and our nursing folks so darn busy up in the ICU. Holly wants to know what's the best day to do a home test before gathering with family. So back it up for her so she knows when it'll be the most effective. Well, if you're going to go gather with your family, let's say I'm going to gather with the family Christmas Day, the best answer is to take a Christmas morning yeah. before you go gather. If not, then just one day before. Remember, the problem is that a, a, a test is a snapshot in time. It tells you negative right then. Yeah. You may not be negative in six or eight hours. Think about the Chiefs right now. They test a lot. A lot of those guys are negative. They're negative. All of a sudden, bang, now we have 13 players out because of COVID-19. Why? The test turned positive. And it just takes a, t a little bit of time, less time with uh, with Delta and a lot less time with Omicron to incubate and make you sick. But the, um, but the reality is you're negative at that moment, and you're just playing the odds. So I think what I would recommend is if you're going to go someplace on Christmas Day, test Christmas morning before you go. So one of our viewers, uh, Pamela, uh, posted this and said she just wanted to thank our guests for all that they do. Says that her cousin is a lung transplant patient and is at, is at our hospital now with COVID, put on a ventilator yesterday. We're not giving up hope. Just wanted to say thank you um, to all of our staff and, and, and people like our guests who are there taking care of people. So anyway, so can we just, just say wanted to share that. You know what, and that is beautiful because we do want to say a big thank you to everyone. And, and Caitlin, I'm sure there are families that are saying thank you to you. Oh, don't forget to unmute, Caitlin. Oh, or something. there you go. You're good. Our good? team okay. had to unmute you. We're going to blame Logan and Anthony. <laughs> I was like, like ah. Christmas yeah, yeah. gremlins. They try to mute me all the time, by the way, <laughs> especially right. when I'm starting to make a Star Trek it reference. Hasn't worked. <laughs> Live long and prosper, brother. Exactly. Yeah, we do. Um, we get things from families all the time, and um, it's it's much appreciated. And of course, we're just trying to be there um, for family member or for patients that are on our unit um, while their families can't be there. 
we hold their hands, we tell them that they um, are loved, that their families are calling and asking about them. Um, we try and do FaceTimes and video chats with their loved ones as we're able to and um, just try and be there for them while their families are not allowed to be there. Grant, when you go into a room with another COVID-19 patient on a ventilator, what do you feel like? Hmm. That's tough. Uh, you know, in my mind, I'm just there to do a job. Um, and that's kind of what it comes down to. Like you can, you can think about your feelings later, but at, at that point in time, you just gotta, you just gotta get through it. You know, um, you know how that patient's doing, but you can't let it get to you. So that's, it's hard. And, you just and gotta push forward. You, and, and do you ever feel like these COVID people are doing it to themselves? Why am I working so hard at this? I'm just kind of going to echo them. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I have a job to do. I love what I do. And you have to be able to kind of just separate your own personal beliefs and thoughts to just do the job. Um, and that's just kind of, you know, my thought process. I've just kind of learned how to deescalate certain conversations. Because for me, a lot of times, they're still able to talk. For them, most of the time, they may be intubated, et cetera. So I've just kind of learned how to just uh, de-escalate, you know, and just do what I need to do and try to take care of them the best way we can. Jess. Yeah, okay, and just one more thank you. Sharon just mentioned thank you for all the nurses that took care of, care of her in the hospital when she had COVID pneumonia. They were the face of care during her time. Um, just thank you, thank you. She's now vaccinated and boosted and feels much safer, but would not wish this disease on anyone. Nursing so, is the glue that keeps the hospital together. They're nursing, respiratory, they're a social worker. Again, we're kind of voyagers, right? We, we drop in and out of rooms and all that, but... Uh, Nursing, RT, social work, dietary, and uh, housekeeping. These are the these are the glue that really keeps the care team together. And I think quality in the hospital is so much more driven by our nursing staff than a lot of other areas. So, I just have to share those thank yous and those messages from those people who've experienced it for sure. Um, Nancy wants to know. I know so many people fully vaccinated now, um, so who have also had COVID. So should we just assume that everyone is likely to get it regardless of their vaccination status? Well, Hawkeye, what we know is that, especially yeah. with Omicron, vaccines, and it looks the same date as we always see, yeah. especially if you're triply, if you got your booster, vaccines yeah. really reduce the risk of illness, uh, yeah. severe illness and death and ventilators. But you're gonna, you, can, you can still acquire Omicron. Mm -hmm. You can still spread it. We learned in the Delta variant, it was much less likely. Remember, we saw that thing in the New York Times where if you'd been vaccinated, yeah. you were like five or six times less likely to get Delta variant yeah. and like 12 to 13 times less likely to die. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Omicron will fall on that scale, yeah. but I think the story is going to be similar. Yeah, and I think we've seen similar stories. Now, obviously, past results aren't indicative of future results, but what we have seen is that the vaccines continue to protect. Uh, protect. What I project is we move further into this six months a year because this virus will be with us in one form or another. More like, more than likely, everybody will be infected. You know, we will start to get out and do things, but we will do them safely and thoughtfully and within the context of the pandemic. So with that infection that is likely to occur, are you going to want to uh, take that infection without being vaccinated uh, and roll the dice with the complications and the uh, issues that can arise? Or are you going to want to protect yourself as much as possible to help reduce the chance of those complications, whether it's hospitalization, needing the ventilator, long COVID, which we know the vaccines can help reduce that chance as well. And so I think moving forward, it is imperative and very important for people to get vaccinated, get those boosters because the, the virus is out there. People are doing things. I've had people who have been super careful in what they're doing because they have cancer or they're immunosuppressed. They don't go out, uh, but I've had people in the hospital who have gotten the disease. I know Dr. Brown has had that. You know, very thoughtful persons, but still get the infection. And so more than likely, 
Most all people are probably going to be infected at one point or another, but the best thing you can do to protect yourself and reduce your chance, reduce the probability of having those complications is to be vaccinated because we've also heard about natural immunity. I think natural immunity does offer some protection, but what we have seen also throughout the pandemic is that those reinfections, even though are infrequent or rare, the results continue to be heterogeneous, meaning they are different. Some people will have less symptoms than they did the first time. Some people will have the same symptoms they did the first time with the first infection. And some people will have worse symptoms and worse outcomes. And I think we saw that early report from that patient that died in Texas, uh, who they suspect is the first patient who died of Omicron. That patient had been previously infected with coronavirus. So I think there's not enough data to support what exactly is going to happen to you if you have had the infection in the past and now get a new variant infection. But we do know that the vaccines will help and continue to protect you and reduce your risk of those severe complications. You know, COVID. No, I just say COVID. Easy to get. Mm. Mm -hmm. Easy to give. Yeah. Hard to get rid of. It's like that really ugly present you get from your cousin. Mm. Okay. Ready? Okay. Yes. Karen has a question. <laughs> Karen has a question. And Marisol, I hope this answers yours as well. But uh, Karen says that she had COVID the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, she also had the infusion. Do you, does she need to wait 90 days to get the booster? I think people want to know how long. And how long? They have to you know, Hawkeye, we've basically taken yeah. all that away. Let's say just go get your booster. I think that's the rule. Well, if you had the monoclonal antibody, though, you really, the, the, re, the, um, the typical, the historical had been to wait 90 days. Um, however, you know, now with Omicron, it, it's really difficult to say. I think if you can push that out as much as possible, uh, that's good. But I think, uh, you know, this new variant just kind of brings a little tweak into some of that historical guidance. But the historical guidance had been to wait 90 days. If you had it in the past uh, or had it, again, there was no specific time between infection and getting vaccinated or getting that booster. Um, that criteria is a little bit changed as well, but I think you bring up a good point, Steve. Now with Omicron, um, there really hasn't been a change in guidance. The historical guidance had been 90 days, but it might be reasonable to think about um, Yeah, because the monoclonals, the, the ones that you've been getting, don't work against Correct. Omicron. The booster does work against Omicron. I actually had a patient ask me this yesterday. I was like, just go get the booster. Yeah. You're going to be fine. It's not going to hurt you to get the booster. So Correct. go get the booster. Dr. Seitz, we have a media question from Lindsay over at 41. Do we know if vaccinated people who get COVID are any less contagious to shed the virus? Mm -hmm. Do they shed it less? Well, we know that's true with the Delta variant. We don't know if that's true with the Omicron variant. Yeah. You are less likely to shed, and the shedding period is, is lower, and the amount of time you or actively excreting virus is lower. We just don't know what the story is with Omicron right now. Yeah, I think that's 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 the good point there, Steve. You know, um, what we do believe and what we have seen in the past with Alpha, I think maybe Beta and then Delta variant. And there was a there's a very good study in the New England Journal of Medicine taken from that NBA population. So they have a lot of resources. They were all able to do a lot of testing, very good setup. And what they found that through those three variants that there was no difference in the peak amount of virus that was shed uh, for those vaccinated people. But what they did see, just as you said, is that their duration of shedding was two to three days less than those people who were unvaccinated. So that would lead to helping decrease the rate of transmission. Uh, we also know from real world experience that vaccines did help reduce the rate of transmission, especially in households. Unfortunately, with Omicron, we don't know. We would hope that would play up. But overall, um, I think the main part is that even if your peak viral load doesn't really change from variant to variant, maybe because you're, you, you, know, you really need those T cells to kick in, but certainly the duration of shedding in those uh, infectious amounts could be less. Yeah, a lot less. Okay, Jess. Brian and Megan have similar questions. What about our kids 12 to 15 who have not been able to get boosted yet? So I think people are wondering if they got boosted mm -hmm. six months ago, are they, or if they got their last yeah. vaccine six months ago, are they able to go ahead and get boosted? Well, there's not an EUA for that. So technically yeah. you can't do it. And so, um, I mean, you can try and sneak it through, I guess, someplace. But the reality is the early use authorization does not allow yeah. for boosters. And I'm not sure what the time frame is for that. 
And there was some data that came out with Pfizer um, last week looking at the dosing in children, mm. uh, young kids, in the, like six months to two years, and finding that it was not effective. The, the vaccine does not appear to be effective. But they were going to now, instead of changing the dose because the dose was really low, they are now going to test and see what happens after a third shot with the, with the really young kids. Yeah. But in the 12 to 15-year age range, um, we're just going to have to wait for early use authorization mm -hmm. uh, Doc Hawk to be expanded, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, uh, we here at, at the health system, you know, really abide by and are discerning as far as the EUA and what the, the regulations and the stipulations are. Uh, so we, we certainly don't go off label as far as that goes. You know, that being said, 12 to 15, overall, do I believe those vaccines are safe? 100%. Is there a difference between a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old? Immunologically, probably not anything. 12, you know, it, it's hard to really understand that. And just as you said, you know, there are ways that people have done to go into other pharmacies or private clinics to get those. Uh, but certainly, you know, we at the health system have to continue to recommend and use under the EUA stipulations. We will continue to do that, but overall, I believe that these vaccines, for the current people who are eligible for vaccines, these vaccines will continue to be safe. The other thing, just to point out, that some pretty big news over the last week about the J&J &J vaccine, and I think we're really tilting toward messenger RNA vaccine. Mm -hmm. You and I have yeah. always been a little tilted yeah. towards mRNA vaccines, but probably not getting the J&J &J vaccine unless there's really a compelling story of why you don't want to get a one-shot vaccine. So, okay, Jess. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, I think so. You guys good? Look at my team here. All right. Thanks. Well, Allie just asking, are we sequencing Omicron versus Delta at KU? We're not. We send the sequencing out to the state reference lab where that's done. It's, it's, it's really done throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm. and state reference labs mm -hmm. or in the CDC offices. Gretchen, curious, Israel, um, she is hearing, is now going to four shots. Mm -hmm. What do the docs think of that? Yeah, I think it's just a question of another booster because yeah. of the Omicron surge. And if you've been six months after your last booster shot or, you know, four to six months, some people are saying every four months, mm -hmm. that seems like a lot. But yeah. I know that they're talking about doing that. And, and I just don't know that we have the information yet to, to recommend that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Marisol uh, wants to know, can an autoimmune disease block COVID? Her husband got COVID last, uh, last week, the rest of the family, everyone vaccinated. Um, had been negative all those days. Um, yeah, I don't think so we would say curious. that autoimmune. What, what yeah, autoimmune doesn't really block COVID. In fact, mm -hmm. autoimmune patients with autoimmune disease, Hawkeye, they are at higher risk mm -hmm. of bad outcome with mm -hmm. COVID, not lower risk yeah. for a bad outcome. Is there any specific type of an autoimmune disease that will give you a better outcome? I, I've not heard that. I've not. I mean, we, you and I follow the CDC database pretty closely. I've not seen that. Have you? No, I'm not aware of that yeah. at all. Okay. I don't know that that would offer any protection. Um, autoimmune, you you have a, uh, you know, your uh, your immune system is not functioning properly. Usually, usually attacking self cells or self epitopes, and that is what's causing all of the problems that you have when you have a specific autoimmune disease. But I don't see any protective effect or benefit against COVID for that. No. Jess, I want to have a let's ask one more. Then I have a few questions for our guests today. Still, sure. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I'm just reading these as they pop through. So hold on, Pat is just curious, will we be looking at another booster anytime soon? I know you've mentioned that, but he just sent that. So can you just- I, I think six months that? after the last one, probably. Mm -hmm. And I know Fauci said he didn't think we're gonna have to reconfigure the vaccine. I think the full jury's still out on that a yeah. little bit. We'll see. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see if we, we do reconfigure it a little bit, but let's just see how the Omicron crisis goes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the way it's been going, when you do pivot these vaccines and you pivot that spike protein, by the time it's probably ready to roll out to any subjects, you've already developed a new variant. That's yeah, kind of I think that's but, and so and that's why the booster looks like it's working pretty yeah. well. Caitlin, let so, me ask you a question. Caitlin, uh, what do you do to get away from this stress of this? Mm. Well, 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 how do you cope? Um, you know, that's been kind of a revolving um, answer for me. Traditionally, it's travel is what's um, you know, my passion, but that, that changes once COVID and um, the pandemic's a real thing. So leaning on my support systems, my coworker, we have an amazing manager um, and amazing resources on our unit, um, leaning on my friends, my family, just trying to find the little daily joys and um, escapes that you can. 
Yeah. How about you, Grant? How do you how do you cope? Well, uh, you know, you just you just gotta get with your friends, um, just kind of over the phone, chat with your friends about what you've been going through, chat with your family about what you've been going through. Um, running's a passion of mine, so I'm continuing with uh, exercise and. Uh, just kind of keeping your head straight. It's hard. Dr. Brown, what do you do? Uh, I kind of echo them. I mean, um, you know, running is a passion of mine, exercise. Um, you and you hockey know. are like workout buddies, right? Don't you guys yeah, sometimes well, do some Well, we yeah, used yeah. to be. You know, COVID kind of yeah, interrupted yeah, some of those used things. To be more beer drinking, <laughs> football watching. Buddies. Yes, yes. So COVID <laughs> has kind of interrupted a lot. So, you know, uh, I have to watch Bam and – Places oh, like that. Again. Yeah. Yeah, no, you have right. to do what? Watch Bama? Yeah, I'm, I'm a oh, Bama guy. Lord. I'm a Bama guy. So <laughs> yeah, I have to kind of watch Bama from home sometimes. But, Although that quarterback's really good. He's a, you know, but no, I just, you know, <laughs> lend on, you know, family, friends, you know, try to do some things outdoors. Um, you know, um, it's kind of been a revolving door. Mm-hmm. As Caitlin said, I mean, you know, we can't really, I really kind of try to avoid the gym or go with peak times or avoid those yeah. peak times. So uh, and you know, and family, I, friends, and I work outdoors. out a ton. And I, I'd gone back to the gym, workout class, I really like it. But now Omicron, I'm like, no, I'm not mm-hmm. doing that. That's what revolving doors, I think. It you know, is revolving doors. You know, once you start kind of getting comfortable again, doing the yeah. classes, and then another spike, and then you stop. and Back on the, the Peloton app, I'm just doing all the yeah. stuff, and you know, so, the spinning class. I do think it, and then for me, it's out. It's about getting outside and getting my yeah. getting myself into a river, and that makes a huge difference. But I think for all of us, Hawk, mm-hmm. we got to find something that we do to take away the stress. Yeah, and it's multimodal. There's so many different things, and it's. But I think it's more important now. We continue to see stories day after day about decreased quality of life, decreased life expectancy, all that, uh, because of the pandemic. So it is important to try and seek out those things that help your quality of life. Maybe it's just turning off the phone for a little bit. Uh, maybe it's going to pray, getting outside, doing those things, being active. There are a variety of things to do, um, but but try and seek those things out because I think uh, in this fast-paced life, it, it is more important to try to actively seek those things out. And in, in the pandemic, it gets harder and harder to do that. Yeah, I've done a little meditation that's worked. I've done a little scream therapy, you know, go outside, just scream really loud. Yeah, and yeah no, I had no particular thing in, in, in yeah. common. Yeah, that can work too, maybe. I try screaming at my cat. She just looks at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> Caitlin, if you could tell us one thing that you'd like to see, folks, if there was one message you could give us, what would it be? Oh, just one. Um, <laughs> no, you get more than one. Go right no, ahead. I'm going to come okay. back to you for your final thoughts in just a moment. So you really get more than one, but okay. I was just trying to be kind of clever in no, asking your question. Um, I think just listen to the research, take everything that you hear with a grain of salt. Um, you know, find reliable resources, ask questions, call the people in your life who are healthcare providers or reach out to your primary care physician. Just, you know, try and listen to the to the right information. I know it's hard, there's so much stuff out there, um, but just try and educate yourself and do what you can to keep yourself safe and, you know, do what you can to keep your family safe, especially with the holidays up and coming. COVID's not a fun Christmas gift. Damn. Well done. Ooh, that's a good what was the one thing you want to tell folks, Grant? Um, I'll probably echo Caitlin. Uh, yeah, so just kind of listen to the uh, research that's out there. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to your docs, um, your doctors, your primary care physicians. Um, and if you do have a question, don't just let it settle in your mind. Um, feel free to reach out to your your providers. So, um, I think what, do you want uh, to tell folks? what I want to tell people. Um, I think uh, just echo what everybody been saying and what we've been saying for the last two years. I mean, you know. Listen to evidence-based medicine. Reach out to individuals such as your primary care physician and other healthcare workers for um, pertinent information. Get vaccinated. Um, get your boosters. Um, and you know, I think uh, kind of what Caitlin said. I mean, you know, COVID is not the best Christmas gift to give someone. And you know, for me, um, 
I also want to say, you know, if you do start having symptoms, pay attention to it. Don't wait till the last minute. Don't come to the hospital when you are essentially at death doorstep and severely ill. So, I mean, just kind of pay attention to what you do and be safe, be thoughtful, mindful. Jess, what would you like to tell our viewers? Well, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate them. I had a nice conversation with one of our wonderful viewers um, last night on the phone, actually. And it's just, um, I just want to wish them just a, a really nice, happy, healthy holiday. And thanks for just um, helping to share our information and, and just being there with us every single day and asking so many wonderful, thoughtful questions. And um, I know we're taking a little bit of a break. You're not today, but we're taking a little bit of a break with these um, these uh, past episodes, which are nice to look back on. Sadly, they seem very similar this time last year to now. But um, so it's just, I miss them when they're not here and we'll, we'll see them in the first of the year and, and good to see you guys. And thanks for all you do. We, we appreciate all of our doctors and our guests and you and Dr. Hawkinson and we just appreciate you and we'll see you all in the new year. And I'll see you next week though. Yes, you will. Hawkeye. Yeah, you know, I would like to echo all of our guests. You know, you don't want to come in and see Dr. Brown and our respiratory therapist, but you're thankful when you get to see them and they can help you and improve how you're feeling. But the key is to not having to get here and not having to come here. And I will kind of reflect back on one thing that Kaylee had said early about there are still people who believe this is hoax. There is a, uh, a very loud minority population. Most of the people want to do the right thing and are conscientious and thoughtful. But I'd like to kind of give a, a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, who said, you can't use reason to convince anyone out of an argument that they didn't use reason to get into. And I think we are dealing a lot with that in a lot of these, uh, especially misinformation campaigns. But the truth of the matter is vaccines work. Vaccines still work. You can protect yourself from the ravages and complications of the disease and decrease your chance of those complications by getting vaccinated getting the booster, and then, of course, doing those, those very important non-pharmaceutical interventions, those infection prevention techniques as much as you possibly can. You know, I am uh, uh, reminded of a song I want to sing, but first I just wanted to remind that uh, our audience that tomorrow we'll ba we're back with an encore presentation of uh, the medical uh, update. We'll, we'll be back live with you next Wednesday. Hawkeye and I will be here to talk about the latest around the COVID cases as we head toward the new year. That'll be important. Here's my, th my, my final thought. It's that song, I'll Be Home for Christmas. I'll be home for Christmas. You can plan on me. Please have snow and mistletoe and presents by the tree. And then the next verse, mm. Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. I'll be home for Christmas if only my dreams. Think about it this way. Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. I'll stay home for Christmas. It's more than just a dream. It's where we are. But the greatest gift, the greatest gift for our teams, for the nursing, for Caitlin, for Grant, for Dr. Brown, the greatest gift that you can give us is to stay home for Christmas, to stay safe. It's not forever. New things are on the horizon. Paxlovid's on the horizon. This pandemic will end. But we want to be all in that end together. We don't want to lose you between now and then. And I promise you, we don't want to lose any member of our team. We'll see you next Wednesday. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available. Thank you.